Steve Eisman made famous in the film The Big Short by betting billions against the U.S. housing market prior to the 2008 financial crisis is now betting against Canada's banks. Steve Eisman, portfolio manager at Newberger Berman, joins us now from New York. Steve, good to be with you. Thank you very much for your time to go through your call, your thesis here. Um, what exactly, Steve, are you calling for to happen here in Canada to make your call betting against Canada's banks correct? Well, I want to start out by saying this is not the big short Canada. I don't think the housing market in Canada is going to collapse. I don't think Canada is going to fall into the ocean. What I'm simply calling for is a normalization of credit, credit losses, which Canada hasn't seen in over 20 years. And I think the, the banks, in terms of their reserves and their balance sheets, are woefully unprepared for that. Okay, so let's start with the credit losses. Why would we start to see credit losses? What has to happen for that to happen? Actually, not much at all. Um, I hope you'll bear with me because this is going to be this a little technical. But the way Canadian banks reserve every quarter is kind of interesting. They divide their loan books into three buckets. They call them stage one, two, and three. Stage one is the bulk of the loan book. That's the loan book that is current. And stage two is early stage delinquencies. And stage three is late stage delinquencies. Last year, they had they reserved against stage two and three. And they had negative loan loss provisions for stage one. And so if you added it all up for 2018 for all the Canadian banks, the loan loss provisions in 2018 were almost all universally lower than 2017. And that lower loan loss provision represents 90% of the earnings growth for the Canadian banks. Now, reserving for stage one is completely model driven. It, it depends on your view of the economy. And the Canadian banks all adopted the, the position last year for some reason that I can't completely understand, the Canadian economy is getting better. Um, now this year, CIBC broke ranks and said that their models are showing some deterioration, and yet they still reserve negatively on stage one. And despite that, their loan loss provision was up 120% year over year. So my view is that at some point, this nonsense of negative reserving on stage one is going to end and the loan loss provisions for all the Canadian banks is, are going to go up considerably. That's my thesis. How bad the credit cycle will be, we'll see. So, Steve, you're saying, though, that the bulk, which is stage one, accounts for a significant portion of the bank's profits. So you're essentially saying that the profits are going to decline? Very clear. Sta stage one is, is all the loans on the balance sheet which are current. And that's the, obviously the bulk of the loans. Now, you're required to provision um, for that group of loans, depending upon, it's, it's a purely model driven, um, and the models are driven by the bank. So, for example, if you think the Canadian economy is getting a lot better, you could argue that you need to provision negatively for mm -hmm. stage one. And the Canadian banks are doing that for at least for last year and the year before. And that, and that negative loan loss provision on stage one is what has contributed the most by far, like 90% of the earnings growth of the Canadian bank is, is because of that negative provisioning. I think at this point in the, in the cycle, I, mean, I just went to a lunch about Canada where all the economists were all arguing whether or not Canada is going to have a soft landing or a hard landing, but it's going to be a landing of some kind or another, and therefore the Canadian bank should not be negative provisioning on stage one. They should be positive provisioning on stage one, and that's going to cause a very negative delta in terms of the earnings growth of these companies. How that's half the thesis. Okay, that's half. We'll get to the other half. What, to what degree of a negative delta are you talking about? So in other words, if you take a look at all the large Canadian banks and take a look at the earnings growth that they all experienced in 2018, by my calculations, 90% of the earnings growth in 2018 from the Canadian banks was due to the fact that their 2018 loan loss provision was lower than it was in 2017. That's just the math of it. So and the reason why it was lower is because they have very large negative provisioning for stage one. Right. So you're, you're saying that, that the banks are not accounting correctly for the potential for, for loan losses. Where, are we go where and why and when will we see these loan losses? I mean, we'll see. I mean, we'll see if there's going to be housing deterioration this year. There's already been some. 
you know, there's signs of weakness of the Canadian economy. That's why the central bank is, is people are thinking maybe they're going to lower rates. I mean, we'll see how it emerges. I just think even at this point in the cycle, the Canadian banks are not provisioning appropriately for their future losses. You, you say that the Canadian banks aren't prepared. How ill prepared are they? Well, let's get to the other half of the thesis. So the Canadian banks, when they report, all report a capital ratio of around 11 to 12 percent. I believe the minimum requirement is 9.75. So on that basis, they look well capitalized. The problem is, and this, again, this is technical, so I, I apologize no, to your viewers know. for this. <laughs> but the way you capital, the way you calculate an 11 to 12 percent capital ratio is the numerator is capital. The denominator is not assets, it's risk-weighted assets. And that means every asset on the balance sheet is multiplied by its risk weight. And most of the risk weights are created by the um, Canadian banks. So mm -hmm. for example, um, Canadian banks assume almost no losses on their mortgage books. And therefore, they have risk weights of 5 to 7% on their mortgage books, which seems to me absurdly low. But my point is just that, look, Canadian banks are currently experiencing losses of 30 basis points. If you get an, a normal credit cycle, nothing catastrophic, just a simple normal credit cycle, those losses could easily go to 100 basis points. That's not a calamity. It's just a normal credit cycle. But what happens when losses go up is that risk weights go up. And my calculation is that you could see capital ratios, if losses go up to 100 basis points, capital ratios could deteriorate by about 200 basis points. So instead of being 11 to 12 percent capitalized, they'd be hmm. 9 and a half to 10 and a half percent capitalized. All of a sudden, the Canadian banks would not be well capitalized anymore. So That's another, the other half yeah. of the thesis. So in other words, there's a real multiplier effect. Yes. As losses, there are two impacts as losses go up. Losses go up, the provision has to go up, so that hurts earnings. But in my world, the more important impact is the capital ratio. Banks go down when capital ratios deteriorate. What kind of decline then would you expect to see, given the capital ratios where you expect to see them? What would that mean for the stock prices in terms of percentage declines? I'm not going to make that prediction. They'll go lower. You know, how much lower we'll see. But are we talking but, like 20%? Uh, I can tell you, I could just tell you. Or 30 or 40 or 50? Oh, if, look, look, um, 20% plus, that's about as much as I'll bet at this point. Okay. Um, but going back, Steve, you're, you're talking about uh, lo losses on, on mortgages and, and losses on the I'm mortgage. talking about not just mortgages. I'm talking about, I'm trying, I'm thinking a lot broader than that. I'm talking about that the risk reward in owning the Canadian banks is very much one-sided on the wrong side because if they're in some ways, they're priced for perfection. They're among the most expensive banks on planet Earth on a price to tangible book basis. And they are not nearly as well capitalized as they appear because I think their risk weights are too low. Steve, some would say, though, that the Canadian banks, particularly going through the financial crisis, are some of the best managed banks, that, uh, that the fundamentals actually warrant higher multiples on Canadian banks versus so many other banks around the world. Uh, we do have the benefit or the bid, perhaps, of an immigration-friendly country that helps, of course, the housing market. We all seem to be living in a world of lower for longer interest rates as well. Why won't all of those factors help the Canadian banks, help the Canadian market, but also continue to have a little bit of a bid underneath the housing market and therefore the mortgage market? Well, I mean, Canada in that sense is like Australia, um, similar oligopolistic, um, oligopolistic banking models, similar friendly regulators, uh, similar profitability dynamics, similar um, risk in terms of housing and exposure to housing. You know, at this point, Australia's housing market is down around 8 to 10 percent. So, excuse me, my earbud came out. Mm -hmm. um, if things go, it, I mean, if, if the global economy goes in a certain direction, Canada will follow. And I, look, I, I, like I said, I'm just calling for a normalization of credit. It's just that the way the Canadian banks have been provisioning and set up their capital ratios, they're, not, they're very ill-prepared even for just a normal credit cycle. Steve, it's interesting, though, when you short a Canadian bank, there's the, the cost to borrow, 
there is the cost to carry, paying the dividends. Mm -hmm. Why not short something else somewhere else? Seems like it's an expensive trade. Now listen, Canada is a very nice country. The people are extremely polite. This is not personal. But, you know, when some of the, the Canadian executives say, how could you short our banks? It's a 5% dividend yield. I'm like, listen, I'm not here for 5%. A 5% dividend yield is not that big a risk to me. Well, that, that's why I would think that your upside by going betting against has got to be more than 20% plus. Well, maybe it is, but I don't need to say that on television. <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to get a little bit more of, of your views, though, in terms of shorting. When you took a look at the U.S. market and, and some of the reasons to short 33 to 1 leverage in the U.S. banks, where, where do the Canadian banks stand from a leverage perspective for you? Um, it's kind of complicated because half of their mortgage, something like half of their mortgage books are guaranteed by the, by the um, Canadian government. So that really, I don't think of that as risk, so you need to take that out. I mean, they're not levered 33 to 1. I mean, I'd have, I can't remember offhand how much they're levered. It's probably at least 25 to 1. Okay. So when you do take a look, though, at how the mortgage industry and the housing market is in Canada versus the United States, the fact that we do have insured mortgages, is that that doesn't seem to be a bit of an equation for you or, or factoring into the equation in terms of a, 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 I, I'm a not, real risk? I, I'm not... My, my thesis has absolutely nothing to do um, with the insured mortgage books that sit on the Canadian bank balance sheets. I mean, the, the Canadian government will, will back that up regardless of what the losses are like. My, my focus in terms of the losses are, are the uninsured mortgage books, the commercial loans, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's your take on the commercial loans here in Canada th then? Well, I mean, so far the credit seems okay. You know, if, if oil prices were to go down again, there'd be issues. Um, I, I think the the oil, the look, Canada has ridden the commodity super cycle with Australia like professional surfers, and they're to be congratulated for that. But you know, given the the growth in oil in the United States, oil production, Canada's oil is not needed nearly as much. Mm -hmm. So the underlying strength of the Canadian economy. I think is weaker. The long-term growth prospects for the Canadian economy are not nearly as strong. And you actually saw that when the Canadian banks all reported most recently their first quarter. It was probably the worst quarter I've seen from Canadian banks in a very, very long time. And I'm not talking about credit. I'm just talking about the lack of revenue growth. There's no net interest margin expansion anymore. So I don't understand the bull case for owning the Canadian banks in that Revenue growth under a best case scenario, I think, is going to be extremely weak. Steve, what, what's the catalyst, though, for your call right now, in the sense that um, you were short the Canadian banks, or at least presented the idea at the Irisone conference in 2013 in New York? You were short yes, the did. summer of 2018. I understand, or at least believe, that you are increasing your short position. What's the catalyst for your call? When will, when do you think this will happen? Is it a slow bleed or is there a catalyst? So I think the catalyst, well, first of all, when the, when the Canadian banks report second quarter numbers, and I, I can't remember offhand when that is, I think it'll be another punkish quarter from a revenue perspective. To really get the story going, you know, last quarter CIBC, I said, again, broke ranks. It was the first Canadian bank to say that their models indicated a deterioration in the Canadian economy. And yet still, CIBC reported a negative loan loss provision for stage one. So to really get the story going, you need to have a Canadian bank come out and say, there's some deterioration in the Canadian economy, and as a result, we have a positive loan loss provision for stage one, and that would crush earnings. And that would crush, crush earnings? Crush it. And crush it. To, to, again, to what degree? I mean, if you look at the at at you know the models that that uh, I mean, I don't have the sensitivity analysis in front of me, so I apologize. But um, the Canadian banks would not be anywhere close to current, to the estimates that are out there. Do you think that? Uh, and you said that the Canadian banks, the CEOs, that they're an oligopoly. Um, do you think that they're too dismissive, and Canadians perhaps are too dismissive in terms of the risks facing the Canadian banks, or at least the Canadian bank earnings, and therefore the stocks? Well, I th look. I think Canada has not had a credit cycle in a few decades. 
I don't think there's a Canadian bank CEO that knows what a credit cycle really looks like. And so I just think from psychologically they're extremely ill-prepared. And given how low the risk weights on their balance sheet are, I think they're unprepared for how much their capital ratios could go down if there's just, I, again, I can't emphasize yeah. it enough, just a simple normalization of credit. Not a calamity, just a simple normalization of credit. So Steve, what does that look like? What does a normal credit cycle look like? Well, we, I think if you, a, credit, a normal credit cycle, nothing calamitous would be going from the current 30 basis points of losses to 100. Believe me, if you, know, you compare that to what happened in the United States, that's a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. And what's the, um, what's the reflexive impact on the economy? Non-economists, I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you how, you know, how much okay. slower the uh, Canadian, I don't think of it in those terms. Okay, so just the, the real focus on, on the banks. They just and, focus on financial institutions. So financial institutions, are you looking at the mortgage insurance companies as well? Well, there's Genworth uh, that, that I, I'm involved with, and there's Home Capital Group, and I'm involved with that as well. And what are the Canadian banks you're involved with? Well, it's public, so there's no point in hiding it. The, the three banks that I'm short in Canada, uh, and again, it's not personal, I got nothing against them, <laughs> a Royal Bank of Canada, CIBC, and Laurentian. And Steve, um, from a timing perspective, um, again, when do you think we're going to start to really see this? Because you're going to be depending on the banks to change their loss provisions. Well, yeah, that <laughs> that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, but at some, but like I said, you can't have negative loan loss provisions forever. That's for sure. When the, when they'll be forced to change, I don't know. But I'm pretty confident that this that this quarter that they're going to report is not going to be a strong quarter by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. And I'm not talking credit. I'm just talking revenue is going to be, again, very weak. Steve, you know, when you take a look at the banks, and you take a look at their profit, their growth, et cetera, we're so focused on, on the mortgage, well, the loan side of the business. What about the fact that so many of these bank CEOs have been over the past couple of years diversing, diversifying their business outside of the Canadian borders uh, into different product areas, into wealth management? Where does that factor into your modeling? Well, I mean, look, I have models in all the banks, um, but you know still just just the way the math works if you if you change the loan loss provision on stage one from negative to positive the impact of that has just a much bigger impact on the income statement than anything else that's going on in the canadian banks period end of story and steve then last question um what got you interested in the canadian banks and have you been here is there anything else that you're seeing as you do your analysis that that strikes you I I like I like Canada. I go there a couple of times a year. Um, I mean, look, I do for my whole career. I've done. I've examined. One of the things that I've done is examined financial companies all over the world. So I've I've done the U.S., but I've also done a lot of research on Europe, and I've done a lot of research on Canada for many many years. Okay. It's not like I'm picking on Canada just to single them out. No, you just you just think that there's uh, an opportunity for you. That's correct. Okay. But like I said, I just want to emphasize enough, this is not the big short Canada. I'm yep. not c calling for some enormous massive of losses. The Canadian banks are not going to have to be bailed out by the Canadian government. There's none of that. It's just a combination of going from a negative provision on stage one to a positive provision and the impact that that's going to have on risk weights, which will hurt capital ratios. Okay. But at the end of the day, the Canadian banks will still be standing.